My name is Karen Hill and I'm in Edmonton. Today is the 1st of May 1984. I'm interviewing Mrs. Isabel Monroe Smith. This is the Oral History of Social Work in Canada project, a project of the Canadian Association of Social Workers. Mrs. Smith, in order to begin, I wonder if you might tell us when and where you were born and a little bit about your early life. Well, I was born in Edmonton here and I was born in 1914. And uh, I grew up and went to both school and university in Edmonton. My father was a doctor here. And uh, during the time that I was at university, he was connected with the university as the uh, chief of uh, surgery mm -hmm. and professor of surgery. Uh, he had gone to McGill for his medical training. And so it was kind of natural that I thought in terms of McGill with regard to social work. At that time, the McGill School had been kind of abandoned, if you will, by McGill, uh, but was still retained on the campus and had been, um, the support had been rallied by the community, uh, the social work community in Montreal to support the school. So it was known as the Montreal uh, School of Social Work. Do you uh, have a knowledge of what had happened to the... It was just that it was expensive. It was an expensive co course, as any type of clinical training is. And it was during the Depression. And uh, so McGill had decided that was one of the things they could do without financing. <laughs> Did you do that social work? Um, how did that affect the, the education that you got at the Montreal School of Social Work? Well, it's hard to know what it was like before that. Uh, I don't, we didn't feel that it was badly affecting our education. We had certainly a very strong backing and a very strong investment by the community itself in terms of social work placements, field placements, and so on. Uh, we had lectures on the campus, and uh, as far as I know, the uh, professor's times were donated, and there was no charge for classroom space or anything like that. So, although McGill was kind of abandoning us in terms of the total budget, uh, they were certainly making it possible for us to continue by uh, having accommodation on the campus and so on. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a recollection about who some of the faculty were? Dorothy King was the director of the school, and uh, again, that was, for me, a bit of a link to Edmonton, because she had worked in Edmonton uh, prior to 1918 oh. uh, as head of the uh, social work, uh, city social work. So there was a direct link there. Mm -hmm. Um, and were there other people that you have the recollections of? Uh, on the faculty, Muriel McCray, and I can't remember what her name was then, who later became the director of the uh, children's service in Montreal. Mm -hmm. She was one of the part-time faculty people. We had a lot of part-time faculty who were working in the field. Mm -hmm. We had a Mary Brisley who came from New York who was uh, a fairly well-known casework expert who did a fair, a fair bit of publishing. A lot of her articles were in very early social work journals. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember the name of the chap that we had from Rupert. He came from Cleveland, I think it was, from the settlement house there. Was hmm. uh, a, uh, I think he was the director of the settlement house. So people would come in from from other places and yes. do one course and do one back? course, and, and uh, we'd have a fairly concentrated course, maybe for half the year or something. And we would have the first and second years sometimes having the same professor, not necessarily the same course. Hmm. It was a small school, very, uh, very small at that time. I can't remember the total number, but I don't think we were more than about 15 in each year. Mm -hmm. Who were some of your fellow students? I don't remember. 
trying to remember whether any of them are uh, still working in social work. Uh, Joan Clark, whose father was the director of the Family Service Agency in Montreal at that time, was one of the students. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Margaret Carey, who was, came in from nursing uh, rather than from university. And uh, Jean Fettis, who came from Calgary, and I don't think she hasn't she hasn't done active social work to any large extent since she was married early. And I can't think of any that are uh, still, you know, that are working mm -hmm. or that have been uh, really steadily involved in social work mm -hmm. since we graduated, because that's a long time ago. That was in 37. Mm -hmm. Did you do field placements when you were there? Yes. Uh, it was standard practice at that time in the school in Montreal that all first year students did their first year placement in the family agency. And it was uh, districted, so they had district offices and quite a few district offices, so it was possible to do that. And uh, it was really uh, a pretty good base. I think that we were all fairly happy with that kind of arrangement. Um, it sounds like that was your first experience at uh, direct service uh, social work. How, mm -hmm. how did you how did you find that new experience? How did you feel about that? Well, I found it very interesting. Uh, I can remember uh, one of my friends commenting uh, who had done field work. I forgot where she did hers, and then she was later friend, but she. Uh, remembered her first field visit and how uh, relieved she was when the people weren't home. <laughs> Went back home. <laughs> yeah. Supervisor simply indicated that she'd have to go again. I can't remember having that kind of uh, uh, concern, but I'm not sure. That may have been, yeah, I, it may have been something to do with uh, my father having been concerned about my taking social work and thought it was uh, an odd thing to be doing. <laughs> he had he had thought it would, and I don't know whether this was a stall tactic, tactic or not, but he suggested that I maybe would take nursing first and that that would be a good background for uh, social work. Well, I had just finished university and uh, I frankly thought that the idea of taking something else uh, for another uh, three or four years like nursing I had no appeal whatsoever, so at that time I was at least smart enough to write to the director of the school and ask her, Dorothy King, whether this was a good idea or not, and she agreed with me that it wasn't particularly helpful, <laughs> that it would be better to, at that point, uh, take the social work. So then uh, my father's next suggestion was that I should... Uh, 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 go to the outdoor clinic here, which at that time was situated uh, down in the center of the city. It was attached to the university hospital. And uh, then do some home visiting with the nurse who was uh, a uh, public health nurse for the clinic. And I did that. And uh, I saw some of the places that I was going into and so on. I felt it was a little awkward kind of an arrangement because I didn't have anything to do. Mm -hmm. You know, and I felt it was really rather awkward anyway, just being at the clinic because again, I didn't really have a have a role to play. Yeah. However, you know, it I guess it exposed me at least <laughs> sure. to the situation that I would be uh, working in. Yeah. Uh, but I was interested uh, in taking social work out of uh, the uh, psychology courses that I took at the university, and one professor particularly, I think, was the one that. I uh, had an interest in how psychology had a bearing on uh, what was happening to people. Mm -hmm. uh, he and his wife had taken a couple of uh, children who were having difficulty with the law to live with them and uh, to try and see if they could do something that would turn the uh, orientation around a bit. Mm -hmm. And well, I don't know if that was a 
my new successful experience. He was that kind of a person, you know, that was just interested in the more practical application of the theory. Mm -hmm. so. And you sort of you picked up on that and mm -hmm. followed through? So it actually, it was interesting because I think there were, in a small, fairly small psychology class, there were at least three others I knew that were in the same class that I was that uh, took social work. Hmm. Uh, one at uh, McGill and the uh, others in other schools. Mm -hmm. But uh, quite an influential mm -hmm. professor. Mm -hmm. To go back uh, for a second to McGill, then, uh, did you do a second placement in your, in your next yes, year? Yes, the next year I did a uh, placement in the Children's uh, Placement Center, the foster home area. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a feeling that was the only placement I did. I wanted a mental health placement, but I, I, think, I, did, I think that wasn't what I got at that point. I think that I got the uh, children's placement. And I think, again, it was a full year placement. Mm -hmm. When you finished uh, your term at McGill, uh, where did you go then? Well, actually, uh, I had, in my second year, I had, at that time, we had block placements as well as the concurrent placements. Mm -hmm. We had the concurrent placement during the year, and then we had uh, about a six-week or a two-month block placement, as I recall. And the second year, the block placement was arranged for me to go to Toronto to the children's aid there because the children's aid pattern was one that uh, seemed to be considered a fairly good type of provision for uh, children who were needing some kind of protection or who were in difficulty. And uh, it was Dorothy King who him, having known the Alberta situation, thought that I should go and take the uh, field placement there, which mm -hmm. I did. And we had, I tell you, the office I don't really think was much bigger than this room, really, yeah, in the children's aid. But and there people. were desks all along the side there, the side there, and both ends and down the middle. I'm sure there were 15 workers in that place. Mm. And one phone, if I recall, I used to do my phoning from the uh, place I was living in, yeah. <laughs> close at hand. Imagine. <coughs> so it gives you some idea of the uh, difference in the quarters mm -hmm. at that time to what they later became. Mm -hmm. And where did you go after you finished your, your uh, that? Well, then I came or... back to Alberta because in actual fact, I really wanted to work in Alberta. And uh, I uh, busied myself sort of looking for different possibilities in terms of jobs without much success, I must say. And one of the places that I applied because of uh, the interest in children's work was to the provincial government. At that time, uh, there was uh, Mr. Hill, who was in charge of the child welfare placement. And uh, he suggested, in all seriousness, that first of all, they didn't need any trained social workers in the provincial setup, that they had as much staff as they needed, and there really wasn't any need for a person with a social work background. But he definitely thought that perhaps Edmonton and Calgary between them could make some use of a trained social worker. And if I could negotiate with the Edmonton and Calgary uh, city offices to employ me half time, the provincial government would pay myself and pay my uh, transportation back and forth between two cities. <laughs> um, needless to say, I didn't bother following that up. So actually, uh, I didn't really uh, find that I was that it was very viable. So I, I was getting offers from Montreal in connection with uh, possible job openings, and I refused it one or two, and then I decided that really I better be careful, or I might never work in 
pencils to work again if I went on. Mm -hmm. So then I went down and worked with what was then known as the Women's Directory. In Montreal? In Montreal, which was a facility for unwed mothers and uh, it provided foster home care uh, for the uh, for the uh, babies and children of the unwed mothers up until the children were six years old and then they were transferred to the uh, uh, to the uh, I've forgotten what it was called at that point it had been the uh, children it was later called the children's service but what it was at that point I can't remember it did started out as the upper no the uh, Protestant home. Protestant home. And they, yes, and they amalgamated with uh, another organization and became the Children's Service. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a specific question mm -hmm. about <clears throat> services in Quebec at that time? Mm -hmm. uh, it came up last night over a dinner conversation, interestingly enough, and some of us had heard that illegitimate children. Let's see, how did it go? Illegitimate children could not be adopted. That if, <clears throat> if a child was an orphan, as long as he had two legal parents, the child was adoptable. But if he, did, if he was illegitimate, he could not be adopted in Quebec until 1969. Oh, I Is don't it? believe that. No, that doesn't, that doesn't fit with uh, anything I knew in uh -huh. working with those two agencies. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly there was no, 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 uh, no, I wasn't working with the unwed mothers before they had, before their babies came. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my assumption always was that there was certainly no indication in uh, the agency I was working with that, that uh, if the mother wanted to have released the baby for adoption that it wouldn't be adopted. And it's interesting and something that I'll have to ask other people as well. You have to track that down through actual legislation, yes, yeah. because uh, that would be very surprising if that was true and we didn't know, you know, and that there wasn't some emphasis on that as a factor that you had to consider. Sure. Sure. Uh, with the mothers. Who were some of the things that you had to take into account when you were working at that agency? Well, the, really the biggest headache was this uh, Quebec Public Charities Act, QPCA, which paid a certain amount per day or something for the children. And it was it seemed as though it was always very complicated bookkeeping. And you always had to be keeping track of <laughs> something. Mm -hmm. with the QPCA. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as the uh, the work was concerned, it was really uh, dealing with the, uh, the foster homes and uh, some of the, uh, the homes for the very tiny babies uh, tended to be really generally short-term placements as I recall. Um, yeah. uh, they were comfortable in looking after small babies, but not beyond that. And so uh, the uh, the more the, the foster homes that you got to know fairly well seemed to be uh, the ones that had the longer term placements. Mm -hmm. So the, the the infants would go to a place and stay for a while, but then when they got to be Two or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. You'd need to find another place for them. Mm -hmm. Do you know what? Probably happened? before that. I think. I think by about a year, they were you know, more settled in a, in a foster home that was going to be of longer standing. And I remember the one I remember best, I guess, because I was most distressed by it, was a youngster that had. Uh, been in a baby home and he was a beautiful baby, just a lovely baby. And 
In the baby home, I think he was cranky. Seems to me he was, because that was the thing that was so different when he was in the other home. And he went into a home that really would like to have adopted a second child, but didn't feel financially able to do so. And uh, this baby was placed in that home and was very well accepted by the whole family, just really was uh, incorporated in the family pattern. Mm -hmm. And the man was a chauffeur. And in the summers, his job, the family went with him to the country where these people live. And the agency policy was that the, the uh, children had to be placed in an area where they could have medical attention through the agency. And so they wouldn't let the child go with the family because of this regulation or rule or something that they had. And to me, uh, then and forever after, uh, that was a wrong thing to do in terms of the child. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, would have been better to let the child take the risk Mm -hmm. If there was a risk, which, uh, you know, there was nothing uh, necessarily particular risk, particularly risky about it, except that I guess they were further away from a doctor. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that kind of policy mm -hmm. came first? But that policy came first, yeah. And I suppose might still in some instances because of uh, uh, legal liability or something. I don't mm -hmm. know. <clears throat> During the time that you were uh, at that agency, um, in other provinces, there was uh, there was a lot of difficulty finding adoptive and foster homes, and a lot of children were uh, placed or adopted out of province or out of country. Was that something that was an issue for you in no. Montreal in those years? No. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Were you at, at that uh, the women's directory uh, for a long period of time? No, I was there, I think, for one year. As I recall, I'm sure it was one year. And then I came back west again, decided I would still come back and uh, hope to anchor to something. Was there a job waiting for you? No, no, there wasn't. Uh, but uh, it was shortly after that that the uh, jobs became available in the mental health area in the provincial, what was then the provincial mental health clinics. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I applied for one of those. And um, it was interesting because again, it shows you how the world has changed <laughs> because I applied and I uh, I drove down to the hospital at Moka because they, that was the place where the clinics, um, the headquarters were. Mm -hmm. And I was interviewed and, and uh, talked to the doctor in charge. And I think I must have managed to convince him that uh, I was, and he may have even asked me directly, although I don't remember that he did, but he said afterwards that they had some reservation because they felt that if I, if they hired me that I might go off to the east again as soon as I could. And uh, that was just exactly what I was trying to avoid. <laughs> you would come home so, and want to stay there. Uh, yeah, I really wanted to stay in the west. But when they put through for the appointment, the Minister of Health at that time was Dr. Cross, mm -hmm. Cross Hospital was named. He was the Minister of uh, Health and he said he, he wouldn't agree to the appointment uh, because uh, my father could afford to support me. Which <laughs> shook me when I heard that because really, <laughs> you know, <laughs> my father really didn't want to go on supporting me forever anyway. <laughs> he had quite definite ideas that women should be 
or you know, she you know how to earn their own living. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, I guess they uh, wanted me at the clinic, so it was finally work that uh, if I was prepared to go to Calgary, that that would be all right. And then they put somebody else in Edmonton, and it wouldn't be very visible to people. So it didn't matter to me where I was, as long as I was in the West. Mm -hmm. So that's where I was uh, mm -hmm. placed. What, when was it? It must have been in uh, 19, I would think 1937. Mm -hmm. You'd finished the school at in, uh, McGill in 37? I'd finished school at McGill in 37, so no, maybe it was in 39. Mm -hmm. So war was just getting war was just getting started because I mm -hmm. remember that the girl who was uh, placed in the Edmonton office, who had graduated from the university but didn't have a social work background, and she and I were uh, placed in Red Deer for an um, initial orientation at the uh, school for the. Uh, uh, Retarded children, mentally defective children. Mm -hmm. You were <clears throat> doing a, uh, well, you're getting this training at a school for the retarded. Were mental health and mental retardation seen as, seen as part and parcel of the same? They, they, were, they were, they were, uh, they weren't the same thing, but the same clinic dealt with the uh, two. Mm -hmm. uh, the doctors dealt with the two uh, hospital patients. In the hospitals, sometimes came from both groups: mm -hmm. the uh, mentally ill and the mentally retarded. And we're so uh, the the reason for the placement at the Red Deer School was simply to make sure that we had some exposure, I think, to the uh, seriously uh, defective children. Mm -hmm. So when you finished your training and you returned then to Calgary to mm -hmm. work in a clinic there. Mm -hmm. What was your work like? My work was interesting because I was a one-man office and <laughs> so I was the psychologist, the social worker, and the typist. <laughs> so I got bored with one thing, I could do the other. Mm -hmm. I was uh, housed in the, uh, it's just the old city hall and uh, that's where they had their uh, well baby clinic and so on. So, you know, I had some contacts there and actually the children's aid uh, people were just down the uh, street, and I got to know uh, two of the people who were working there who weren't, uh, weren't, they were doing social work, and uh, one was a university graduate, uh, but neither of them had social work training, uh, but they had been doing the uh, children's aid type uh, work for quite some time, mm -hmm. and uh, I became quite friendly with both those two people. Mm -hmm. um, well, we talked about social problems and we formed a little kind of club in Calgary of people who were in social work or interested in it. Were there many social workers around at the time? I don't think there were any others with uh, training in Calgary at that time. In fact, I'm sure there weren't. You were it. And there weren't any of them too at that time either. Mm -hmm. And then it was while I was, let's see, it was while I was working in Calgary, I think, that Lillian Thompson moved to Edmonton to establish the uh, Council of Social Agencies and a kind of embryonic family agency and social service exchange. Mm -hmm. Remember the old social service exchange idea? Mm -hmm. And uh, that was set up, and so then when I moved back to Edmonton, uh, yeah, let's see, let's see, when was that? I don't know, I no longer became a threat, I guess, to Dr. Cross, the, <laughs> the job. I was uh, moved back to Edmonton and was with the mental health clinic in Edmonton for about a year before I went overseas. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> During the, the time that you were working at the mental health clinics, um, uh, how, how, did, how did you do your work at that 
time? Was it casework or therapy or what well, it was it was a variety of things. Uh, primarily, we didn't do anything by way of long-term contacts with people, uh, but we acted as a resource for the schools and families, and uh, we traveled to Lethbridge Medicine Hat and Brown Heller from the Calgary Clinic and from the Edmonton Clinic, Lamont. Uh, Red Deer was serviced by the uh, training school. I think just Lamont from Edmonton and the Peace River. And I didn't, uh, I didn't ever get to the Peace River at that time. I think they just went every other year or something, and I was in the off year when I was working in it. And were you again a one person office when you were in Edmonton? Yes. Again, in a large setup of government offices. Yeah. So that, you know, there were other people around, uh, but you were uh, the one man office. Mm -hmm. Were there um, psychiatric services available at that time? We had, the, well, the psychiatrists came from the hospitals. Uh, the psychiatrists in Edmonton, at the Edmonton Clinic, uh, were based at Oliver. At that time, uh, Oliver uh, I was going to say at that time it was still a non-treatment hospital, but I don't think that's right. I think it was a treatment hospital. And Dr. Ralph Schrag, who has since died, but who was in the mental health area in uh, Edmonton and is well known throughout the province, was. And he had, he had taken his uh, postgraduate psychiatric work down in the States and had done some children's work. Mm -hmm. So that uh, it was interesting at that period. Uh, in Calgary, the doctors that came to the clinic uh, were from the hospital at Canoka, and it wasn't always the same doctor. It would be um, one of two, probably. What was the difference between what you did and what the psychiatrist did? Well, uh, we served as psychologists to begin with, so we did the testing, the uh, IQ testing. Uh, we also then did a family history and uh, did a social history if we needed to get things, information from the school and so on, and if uh, things needed to be interpreted back to the school, which very often uh, there, was, there were things that needed to be done. I remember one uh, sweet little girl in Calgary, and she came into the clinic. The family were very concerned because this little girl had been stealing. She was about seven, I guess. If she certainly wasn't more than seven, I would say. And they were really quite concerned that she was stealing. And she was a red-headed, uh, freckled-faced youngster, uh, not particularly uh, attractive-looking, but not un not unattractive certainly. But she had a younger sister who was just like a fairy, you know, beautiful, blonde, tiny child. And everybody, even in that well baby clinic, was sort of commenting and saying, oh, surely they're not sisters. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, it was really, uh, you could see almost what was happening. And we tried to suggest that this might be part of what was going on was simply the lack of the same kind of uh, accolades uh, to the parents. But we couldn't get through to the parents at all, interestingly enough. But we got through to the teacher in no time flat, and the teacher just did a beautiful job. Mm -hmm. uh, got the little kid who was reasonably bright, who uh, in a position where she could show off with the other kids in front of the class. The teacher remarked when she had something new on and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole problem disappeared. But that wasn't really anything very, very deep. 
No, but effective. But it, it was effective, and it well, it was interesting, you know, that uh, you could see some of these things, which you sometimes can see mm -hmm. in the initial stage of a case contact, but mm -hmm. don't stand out again until very much later. During during that time and and the kind of work that you were doing, um, Freudian psychiatry was was at its in its early days, I think. Well, it hadn't been around too long, as far as I know, anyway. What kinds of, let's see, how can I phrase this question? To what extent was that kind of analysis important as opposed to the social kind of thing, that you, the social analysis that you just provided of that family, as opposed to other kinds of ways of interpreting a problem? I didn't find that there was uh, much difficulty with the uh, particular psychiatrists that we were working with. I think they had all been exposed to the uh, Freudian uh, background. Uh, they didn't reject it, uh, but at the same time, they, uh, through their mental hospital work, were fairly anchored to some of the new uh, drug treatments, uh, particularly uh, also the electric shock treatment that uh, had come to the fore. Um, They seemed fairly open to uh, all the social work kind of interpretation. Mm -hmm. And we weren't, of course, uh, really dealing in terms of the uh, adult patients referred. If we were dealing with mental illness, then it was primarily the doctor uh, who was involved in uh, making a diagnosis. The social worker would be involved in getting the background information. And so, on. Mm -hmm. so you wouldn't have had too much uh, contact necessarily with the adult mentally ill. Then. Not through the clinic. Uh, very limited through the clinic, but eventually we did through the mental hospital because uh, at the very early stage of the war, just to ensure that the uh, clinics could be kept functioning. The arrangement was made, since they were losing medical staff, that the two of us who were doing this clinics would go to the hospital for one week out of every four and take social histories for them at the hospital. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. Mm -hmm. So at that point we were working directly with the uh, mentally ill mm -hmm. and doing the testing and so on. To move to another another perspective on the same uh, around the same time um, there's always been or there seems to have always been a, a stigma attached to mental illness and uh, was there much of that at the time? Were you seeing much of it in, in the community? You were seeing some uh, and I suppose basically simply because there weren't facilities in the general hospitals, there probably was a little more feeling about it uh, than there perhaps is now. Although my impression is that uh, it wasn't that much different. But again, you kind of absorb your feeling from the people you're working with more than from the community at large. But for instance, many of the patients would become reasonably comfortable about indicating that they were meant, they knew that they had a problem with mental illness, particularly if it was uh, uh, manic depressive psychosis, and uh, would be quite comfortable about uh, recognizing when it was about to happen and going and uh, asking for admission to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So that uh, my impression, and it's only just a, uh, an impression, is that uh, there are more people now who maybe are exposed to the idea in the family that somebody's mentally ill because of the treatment that's available in the general hospitals, but I don't know that the public attitude has changed graphically. <clears throat> you mentioned that a minute ago that um, you were at the mental health clinics for a while and then went overseas. Um, how did it happen that you went overseas, and what were you going 
Well, uh, the uh, Canadian Association of Social Workers at the very beginning of the war wrote to the British Association and said, uh, would it be helpful if social workers uh, came over to uh, work in Britain? And the uh, British Association wrote back and said, yes, indeed it would be, uh, but that there would have to be a request from the British government to the Canadian government and then so on and so forth. So it took about two years, I guess, for the scheme to get rolling. And Dr. Claire Hinks from Toronto was uh, appointed as director. And uh, then it was, there was an indication that social workers and teachers and nursery school workers could all uh, apply in connection with this particular scheme. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Hinks was noted for his ability to raise money, uh, which he had been doing fairly successfully, but he'd been doing a lot of it in the United States. And his American, his American contacts in connection with that sort of thing, in the meantime, sort of dried up. So one of the first things was that we got these coin cards that we were supposed to get people to fill in with coins of different values to uh, raise money ourselves to send us. <laughs> Try it out on any of my friends and they would have no, no part of it. <laughs> so anyway, I think eventually you must have come up with some better sources of funding in Canada. And we eventually got funded and went off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So when you were in, in Britain, uh, where were you working and what were you doing? Well, we went over uh, with the understanding that we would be uh, working with the children who had been evacuated. Uh, by the t and the nursery school workers, I guess, uh, understood from the beginning that they were going to establish a nursery school training program in uh, Birmingham, but the teachers expected to be out in the evacuation areas, but by the time they got there, a lot of the London children had moved back, and so they were really settled in the London schools, the suburbs of London. Mm -hmm. uh, the social workers were scattered through the reception areas in connection with the social work positions that were uh, needing to be filled. Uh, there were two of us, uh, one girl from uh, British Columbia, who has since died, and myself, who were uh, initially slated for the mental health program in Britain. And that was a separate program from the ministry program, the Ministry of Health. So uh, we were, I was, let's see. I went to Leeds for an orientation period in connection with the program, and I was to stay there to work. But eventually, uh, I went down to Devonshire, and I was with the mental health people, working with the county psychiatrist who was in charge of the county hostels, which were operating at that time, for children who were having difficulty in either settling in their billets or in the local hostels that people were running for. Mm -hmm. These were all children who had been evacuated from different areas, some from London. Uh, most of the ones in the uh, Devonshire area were from Bristol, I think. Mm -hmm. So again, you were dealing with children? Yes. Doing mental health That's care. right. That's right. And I went first to the Bristol Child Guidance Clinic uh, before I went to the uh, area. In, in, uh, I was based in Exeter and then traveled through the county. What's most memorable for you about that time in Britain during the war? <laughs> well, one of my most uh, delightful memories of the children's work was uh, when some children were to be transferred 
from uh, one of the county hostels that uh, the uh, psychi psychiatric service had been responsible for. And they were going up to uh, a place called Biddeford. And the billeting officer in Biddeford was just a real delight. He was out of an advertising background. He'd been in advertising before the war. And he brought all his advertising psychology to bear on his job as building officer. And uh, when I had approached him about taking these children, you could sort of see the wheels go around. Well, you know, if I take these kids, maybe you'll take some of the ones that we want to <laughs> shut off. Anyway. Uh, as I say, it had been kind of a bargaining arrangement I could see when I was getting them to go up there. And when I arrived to uh, take the children up, here they had been sent in from the county hostel with rabbits in rabbit hatches. <laughs> I thought, you know, I can see why they did it and I think that's great for the kids, but I really don't think it's going to improve their reception. <laughs> to Biddeford, because I knew that they were going to put them in the local hospital to begin with. So finally, uh, we sort of I held a conference on the platform. You could see people sort of thinking, what's that, that old so-and-so doing with these children? <laughs> Rabbit. Anyway, one of the station masters came along, and he was quite delightful. And he said, well, you could take the rabbits and look after them, and we could send for them. So the kids seemed to be reasonably uh, happy about that arrangement. Mm -hmm. We got into the car and got them up to Biddeford. And I explained the dilemma to the building officer. And uh, so he said, okay, he would do his best to find a billet where the kids could have the rabbits. So a few days later, I got a letter from him uh, saying that he hadn't been able to locate a billet where they could have the rabbits, but actually he'd been able to find a billet that was close to some place where the rabbits could be also billeted. So if I would send up the rabbits, <laughs> we could have them duly billeted. And then he put a PS, what is evacuation coming to? <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> Social work services for rabbits. <laughs> but it was important for the kids to have sure. the rabbits, of course. Of course it was. Uh, but it was equally important that they get off to a reasonable start where they were going. That's right. And knowing the local hostel and all the you know complications that would occur and so on, I thought, no, it would be better for them if they didn't have the rabbits right that minute. Yeah. Right. Anyway, it all worked out in the end. <laughs> but, uh, oh, there were lots and lots of uh, interesting things that occurred during the war and some very sad ones. There was one little boy that we uh, had in one of the county hostels and uh, we could never, ever, ever find out uh, where he belonged. He and we could never tell whether he was uh, so shaken by the bombing uh, that he never did sort of recover, or whether he had been uh, slightly uh, retarded uh, at the time that he was picked up, or uh, what might have happened. He gave an address uh, in Plymouth. But the actual address didn't exist, and we weren't able to track him down through any of the, uh, uh, you know, sort of normal facilities in terms of trying to track down a kid. And so, you know, I always wondered just uh, what might have happened to that uh, little guy. Mm -hmm. But I suppose if nobody ever turned up, and he was never, they were never able to trace his family, he would just be cared for in the normal uh, system that they had. Children who didn't have homes. Yeah. Did you uh, continue throughout the war? Did you continue then with the the uh, children and mental health work? Yes. Right? Yes. I went from the uh, uh, exit from the Devonshire placement to to the actual child guidance clinic in Bristol, where I had had some previous uh, contact, where I'd done some you know sort of orientation before I went down, and uh, one of the girls 
who was the social worker there, uh, left to take psychiatric uh, for medical training. And they asked me if I would come. And so at that point I did. Mm -hmm. And that was, a, that was a good experience too, because they had been involved in very much of the trauma of the early bombing of Bristol. Actually, the Bristol kids didn't get evacuated until they'd all been exposed to all the bombing that Bristol ever had. So, in some, to some degree, you couldn't help but feel that if kids were having a problem, it would really be better if they went home and you started to deal with the problem in their own setting. So the kids that had been through the bombing in Bristol, they had some kind of stability, which the kids who had been evacuated from London and from their parents. Mm -hmm. Well, and particularly if the kids had been evacuated from Bristol and were having trouble down in Devonshire, mm -hmm. they sort of felt, well, you know, it, there hasn't been any bombing in Bristol since they left, and it would be better if... Uh, they were at home and you knew uh, whether it was the environment or the, something that had happened to the youngster or whatever. But you couldn't say that. You couldn't do that because that was against ministry policy, you know. So uh, mm -hmm. you just had to continue uh, trying. And some of the placements were not really very good. You know, the whole South Coast, because they, their livelihood, many of the places that had children, uh, had been boarding places for people coming uh, for uh, holidays. And so they really weren't terribly welcoming of the children. They, did they see the children as a threat to their livelihood? Well, they didn't see them as replacing the, the threat that had been there. You know, they, they'd lost their livelihood, particularly, basically. Uh, but they didn't see what they got for the children uh, as being reasonable compensation. Mm -hmm. And they weren't really the kind of people who were geared to dealing with young children. You know, they were geared to uh, looking after adults mm -hmm. and making what money they could from the adults being there. Sure. So, you know, there were some of some of the homes that were all right, uh, but by and large, uh, they weren't really the homes that you would choose if you were providing foster home care for mm -hmm. children. Oh, uh, talking about foster home care for children, you know, I still remember one uh, home up in uh, Yorkshire when we was first there. And uh, these people had this youngster, and again, he was maybe seven or eight or something. And they were upset because he was a thief. So I was trying to sort out, uh, you know, why, why was they felt this? Well, he had stolen an apple off their tree. And no amount of uh, uh, attempt to suggest that this was sort of normal child behavior that, uh, no, he was a thief. Mm. <laughs> so I didn't spend very long trying to. <laughs> it just seemed inevitable that he would be better off in another home. Yeah. Um, I want to ask her one final question, or my final question anyway, about that period. Although, if you have other things you'd like to add about that period during the war, that would be great. Um, I wonder um, if during <clears throat> during the war, whether what you had learned about social work ethics and principles, were they relevant? Depends on, on uh, exactly what it is you're uh, thinking about in terms of principles. Uh, I've talked to some people who were doing social work during the war, who one person in particular who found what she had learned at her school of social work as something to cling to. Um, <clears throat> as far as helping her figure out what to do when bombs were falling and kids were screaming and things like that. I've talked to another person who found that practicality really had to rule. Mm -hmm. And the needs of the moment had to um, take precedence over the principles and things that had been so important and were important again mm -hmm. after the war. 
Can can you give a for instance? Uh, because I you know I would mm -hmm. find difficulty in, in separating that out mm -hmm. in particular. Um, the one that I'm thinking of in particular uh, was uh, running a large uh, children's home. Uh, 200, 250 kids, mm -hmm. and was told on Monday by the military commander that he needed her setting for a barracks by mm -hmm. Friday, and she was to get the kids out. Mm -hmm. She had to find placement for 200, 250 kids within five days. Mm -hmm. um, she found it difficult to keep everything in mind that she had learned in school of social work while she was there. Well, it would be kind of impossible to keep yeah. everything in mind. Yeah. <laughs> Just but, do but, the best you could. Yeah. Maybe that's maybe that's not a question that has much meaning for you. Uh, it doesn't really. Yeah. Okay, that's very uh, fair. Yeah. Uh, you know, you did the best that you could uh, on your understanding of uh, what was there. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think your ethics and principles and, and your knowledge uh, is a part of you. Uh, but just like uh, with the kids and the and the rabbits, I had to make a decision as to whether uh, they. Better to have the uh, uh, things sorted out ahead of time, or whether to uh, get them up there and risk the uh, possibility that it uh, might get them off to a bad start in terms of the place they were going. Uh, so I don't. I didn't. I didn't. Certainly, I felt in some instances that because of the war, like I said. Uh, having to leave children in a setting uh, where they were having problems and trying to work with the problems in that setting uh, when you felt it would have been better for them to go home and work with them there. Uh, I felt that was a wrong uh, decision on the part of the ministry, but on the other hand, it was a very firm directive and so you certainly weren't in a position to go against it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they, I suppose, understandably felt that nobody knew whether Bristol was going to be bombed again. Yeah. <clears throat> Are there other things that you'd like to add about your experience during the war? I don't think so, no. I think that uh, those are probably the things that I, you know, that I've recalled mm -hmm. uh, mostly. Uh, certainly it was uh, quite an experience and uh, sometimes I felt that uh, we didn't add that much to the effort in connection with the war, but still we were, we were some bodies over there. And initially I had certainly felt, and I still think this, this is true, that it's almost easier to be in the midst of things uh, than to be uh, dealing with uh, trauma and uh, griefs. Other people's losses and everything at a uh, great distance. Mm -hmm. So, know, so that if you're if you're in the war, uh, you know if you're right in where it's happening, uh, you're so busy just coping uh, that in some ways it's easier than all the separations and so on. I don't know. Anyway, as I say, I never felt that. Uh, I was sorry that I did it. Yeah, there is one other question that I that I wanted to ask, and I forgot. If you wouldn't mind, just one more before we take the break. Did you have contact with social workers who were in the military at that time? In the Canadian military, no. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a friend who was in the American Red Cross. And uh, I eventually did establish contact with her. And while I was at the Bristol Clinic, it seems to me we had contact with an American hospital. And I can't remember now uh, whether there were social workers in the group that we got to know of it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, they were psychiatrists and so on. And it's quite likely that there may have been some social workers in that group, but I don't remember. It doesn't stand out because, you know, our contacts were pretty casual. Okay, maybe that would be a good place to take a break. Okay. That's all right. Sure. Would you like a cup of tea? Okay, when, um, when we broke, Isabel, we were talking about the Second World War. And um, at the conclusion of the war, where did you go then? Well, I came back to Alberta. And uh, I could have gone back with the 
mental health clinics. And in many ways I wanted to because I really enjoyed the work there. But the government in their wisdom were not prepared to allow any kind of uh, credit uh, for the time that I had been away when I had been in fact working in the mental health area. And uh, so I got a little cheesed off at that and I uh, decided that I would look for something else. And the federal government family allowance program was at that point just being launched and they had uh, positions in social work uh, being advertised so I decided that uh, that's what I would uh, apply for, mm -hmm. which I did despite the fact that when I had worked laterally in uh, England for the Canadian government and had sworn I'd never work for the Canadian government again, <laughs> I decided that at least I'd be closer here <laughs> or more accessible in terms of uh, things that were going on. So uh, that's what I did. So then I worked in family allowance uh, in connection with the social work uh, role. Uh, for a number of years. Mm -hmm. Was it here in Alberta? It was here in Alberta and uh, I was responsible in connection with the uh, social kinds of things concerned about the program all over the province mm -hmm. and working through uh, different uh, possibilities in different areas. Mm -hmm. um, I get final allowances today and uh, I get a check once a month and that's the only contact that I have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Things were different then. No, they weren't. That was probably the only contact that most people had. Uh, but there would be problems in some instances. There was one <clears throat> uh, instance in which there was a situation in, up in Lacklevish, in the northern part of uh, Alberta. And uh, the fact of the Family Allowance Act specified that checks could not be assigned but this merchant had taken an extra post office box and had a whole raft of uh, Métis families directing their family allowance checks to this post office box. And uh, that becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was something that the social workers with. Mm -hmm. And there was sometimes talk of abuse, and then you would uh, see uh, what could be done, uh, who was best equipped to check it out. Child abuse? No, uh, no, abuse of family allowance being misspent. The uh, allowance not going for the benefit of the child. Parents using the allowance check to go to the beer parlor, that kind of thing. Um, so there were some expectations as to how that money would be spent. Mm -hmm. Were those expectations written down in regulation or law? Do you know? Uh, it was, it would, certainly there was something that it was to be used for the benefit of the child. Mm -hmm. Uh, how specific that was, I can't remember. I do know, for instance, that some of the uh, uh, some of the books, some of the book salesmen uh, did try and convince people that they better spend their family allowance check on uh, buying things like encyclopedias and so on over a period of time. And there was some misuse in that uh, mm -hmm. connection. Uh, again, uh, if that came to light in terms of families, being families that ordinarily needed the allowance check to buy clothing or uh, fruit or whatever for the child, uh, then uh, you would be concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, in that instance, all we did was uh, really communicate with the uh, company and say, look, this isn't really what, and you're not supposed to be, uh, you know, sort of exploiting the family for the gain of the mm -hmm. company. It's all very well to say books of knowledge or encyclopedias or whatever are important for children, but there are libraries and uh, there are uh, different income levels and, and uh, 
this seems to be going on in the state, you know, in, a, in an area where uh, this is really not acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, what the well, I assume that the provincial government had responsibility for child welfare mm -hmm. um, and child protection and that sort of thing. That's right. Was there any kind of hassle involved with between the federal government people and the provincial government people about stepping on each other's toes regarding this family loans program as it uh, as inception? Not really in, in connection with that, uh, although there was there was a little, I would say, uh, in connection with some of the ward placements of particularly girls from the age of about 10 on were fairly obviously just looking at the uh, sheets of applica the applications and who the allowance was going to. Exploitive in potential and probably in fact where there were a lot of little children, uh, most of whom were under school age, and a 10-year-old or an 11-year-old or a 12-year-old little girl in, being placed in that family, uh, not on a uh, foster home placement, but on a free home placement basis. Mm -hmm. And so we did have conversations with the government about those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. and really raised as much question as we could. Mm -hmm. But uh, they had the control mm -hmm. in terms of the, the children. Yeah. So all we could do was really raise serious questions about it. At the same time, or around the same time anyway, other people were raising questions about child welfare. And health That's right. The IODE uh, commissioned Charlotte Whitman and uh, she hired some other people to do an inquiry into child welfare. Into social welfare in Alberta. Um, how were you involved in or affected by that inquiry and the subsequent developments? Well, we were uh, fairly uh, close to that in that uh, the uh, the family agency uh, with Margaret Dick as the director uh, were certainly called to uh, present. Uh, evidence in, in connection with the commission that was eventually set up. The Hazeldine Bishop is now in Ontario, who was uh, director of the uh, uh, Council of Social Agencies at that time. Uh, I was with Family Allowance still at that time. Mm -hmm. um, we, it was very interesting because we felt that it was important to know what actually was coming out at the hearings and not to have to depend on the paper and the newspaper report because the newspapers at that time were fairly cautious about what they reported that was in any way uh, detrimental to the government. So uh, Hazeldine and Margaret and I agreed to kind of take turns sitting in on the hearings, uh, which we did. Fortunately, I had a hunch that the provincial people might be unhappy uh, at my being present at any point. <coughs> so I had, before we got started, uh, initiated uh, some uh, correspondence with Ottawa in connection with the uh, hearings and what was going on and whether the deputy minister uh, would like to have us keeping in touch with them about what was going on in the uh, 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 hearings because he had also been director of the uh, Canadian Welfare Council. So George Davidson? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, he had indicated that uh, they would be very pleased to have this kind of information. So when the uh, complaint came through, as it did from the government, and <laughs> the uh, dilemma that the regional director was in was whether he was going to please Ottawa or please the provincial government, and he elected to please Ottawa. Mm -hmm. So uh, and nobody stopped me from continuing on with the thing. But that's how sensitive the government were. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, all I was doing was sitting there uh, hearing what people were saying. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned earlier in the interview your discussion with Mr. Hill about the need for trained social workers mm -hmm. and the proposal that he had made. Um, he was involved in this instance too as, as director of child welfare. Yes, he was still director of child welfare at that mm -hmm. point. What kinds of things were coming out <clears throat> for, that were important for you what, that were coming out of those uh, out of that commission? Well, I think there had been a hope for quite some time that we would move beyond having children placed in homes just on the basis that the home was free or that the home seemed to be a good home with no kind of uh, real assessment or real knowledge of uh, the uh, way that a particular child would fit into a particular home. And uh, there was a hope that, and there was a feeling that this was really very important in terms of modern knowledge and uh, modern awareness of uh, what children needed as they were growing up. Uh, I think it was common knowledge uh, throughout Alberta that uh, most of the homes for children beyond a certain age were free homes. Free. That there was no, uh, no commitment to paying room and board for the children or to really establishing a foster home, a real foster home type of would uh, the implication of that situation then be that the kids were essentially indentured? Well, it depends, I suppose, on the definition, the legal definition of indenture. Um, I'm not sure about that, but I don't know. Would it leave the potential open for the kids uh, well, to use as labor? Sure. There was, there was really no question about this being uh, the, uh, that big primary concern that people had. Uh -huh. And sometimes that might not be what happened, and sometimes the uh, placements might have well have worked out quite well. Uh, but I think that uh, it's pretty fair to say that the superintendent of child welfare had most of his uh, public support and most of his support from people who had been involved with him from the people who had adopted uh, adoptive parents and, and uh, children who were uh, adopted and uh, where he had pictures and everything on his wall. Uh, you know, this was obviously a, a very positive kind of experience. Mm -hmm. I've heard it said that as a result of uh, the IODE dash Witten inquiry social work in the province of Alberta was set back 20 years. I don't Any believe that. that. Yeah, I just don't believe that. Uh, I think without the Witten inquiry, uh, nothing at all would have happened. Uh, I think the government. Uh, were very sensitive and they certainly didn't want to change things at all. But I think there was a minority report. Uh, uh, the judge from Lethbridge uh, did put in uh, a fair report and made some very good recommendations, it seems to me, as I recall. Uh, certainly, if nothing else, he must have 
learned a lot through the uh, inquiry and uh, affected things a bit in connection with uh, how things were uh, going to be perceived and dealt with in Lethbridge. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of people, uh, because of uh, Dr. Whitten's uh, tendency to be fairly aggressive and so on, uh, really felt that somebody else could have done a better job. I think the fact is that nobody else would have touched it with a 10-foot pole because the government from the very beginning were not going to make any information available. So, uh, I, you know, that, uh, that comment to me seems to have come from the British Columbia School of Social Work from people who really didn't know anything about what the situation here was. I don't think you would find anybody who was working here at the time who really felt that that had set things back. Mm -hmm. I may be wrong, but you know, I think I know that that was being taught out at uh, UBC and the School of Social Work that this had set it back, and I think that some uh, younger people simply parrot, you know, parrot that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know where it was that I heard it. Mm -hmm. It's something that I've heard in, in a number of places, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. schools of social work have long... <laughs> that's right, that's long right, time. that's right. Yeah, <laughs> geographically as well as yes. chronological. Yeah. Um, what happened when, when you left the Family Allowance Program? Where did you go and, and uh, what happened then? I went down to St. Paul, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. I uh, decided I wanted to go back into frontline social work, not deal uh, through, uh, you know, a lot of intermediaries and with a lot of paperwork. And I wrote to Dorothy King, who was still director of the Montreal School, and told her uh, what I was planning to do. And I asked her uh, what she would suggest, whether I should go and take some more uh, education at this point or go right back into practice. And she advised that I would be better to go right back into practice mm -hmm. and uh, to go into a family agency. And she also uh, indicated that the only family agency she thought in Canada at that point that would give me the kind of uh, experience and training that she thought I would uh, in, you know, find helpful would be the Jewish agency, I think the Jewish Family Agency in Toronto, I think it was. It, I'm pretty sure it was the Jewish Family Agency in Toronto. And she thought there would be a few complications there because of the, uh, you know, the uh, cultural focus. Mm -hmm. And suggested that she thought I well, probably would be better to go to the States. And so I wrote to FSA. And they recommended ones on the west, Seattle, Cincinnati, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and there may have been another one in there. Anyway, I wrote them all, told them, you know, what a great find <laughs> how they liked to hire me. And I had immediate reply from, I think it was Cincinnati and St. Paul. Cincinnati were offering me something that didn't fit with what I told them I was looking for at all. Uh, but St. Paul, who'd had a lot of Canadians <coughs> on the staff through the years, uh, had some confidence in taking somebody from a strange country. And uh, so they said uh, they'd be glad to have me. Mm -hmm. So I went off to St. Paul and I was there for two or three years, I can't remember now which. And yeah, no, they knew when I went that you know it, that I was really going for the experience. Yeah. Oh, about when was that? It was in the uh, late forties or early fifties, I would say. And did you? Uh, what, what did you gain out of that experience in um, Minnesota? Well, I found it uh, a very satisfactory experience. I found uh, I have always felt. I suppose maybe partly from the uh, background of the uh, emphasis of the school that 
working with families in connection with the myriad problems that uh, are faced by families that they bring to a family agency gives you a very broad spectrum of social work concerns. Mm -hmm. And uh, through the uh, board involvement generally with some uh, commitment to uh, advocacy role uh, that you're involved in the community in terms of planning and so on. And I found that uh, the St. Paul agency were really absolutely wonderful in terms of, you know, sort of accepting the fact that I was interested in gaining as much experience as I could. And they certainly gave me every opportunity. I, I was uh, really very, very fortunate, I think, mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. place where I landed yeah. up. And uh, a chap by the name of Al Heckman was director of the family agency there at that time, mm -hmm. and he and Clark Blackburn, who was director in Minneapolis, uh, Clark Blackburn eventually went to uh, FSAA of America, mm -hmm. and I've forgotten where uh, Al Hickman went, but someplace. Yeah. Um, you put you had said that you had decided that you were not going to stay in the states; you were going to go to Canada. Mm -hmm. um, how did it happen that you uh, you went to McGill next? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, well, uh, mainly it seemed to be the uh, the the uh, thing that opened up as a possibility most, the most quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember now uh, what you know what kind of activity I took to locate where I was going to go. Uh, but uh, it was the uh, field field supervisory placement that I uh, took at McGill. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> one of the things I want to ask you about about that particular period of time, and I'm not sure that this was happening at the time that you were there. My dates aren't clear. This. The uh, at some time during the mid '50s, the uh, Quebec Corporation of Social Workers was developed, mm -hmm. right? and it sort of decentralized from. A national organization, individual members to provincial membership. Were you around during that time? I was around during the formation of the Quebec Provincial Association. Mm -hmm. It wasn't separate at that time. Uh, I was uh, one of the people involved, and that was a very interesting experience because there were people from uh, Quebec City and from the Montreal French branch and from the Montreal English branch of uh, social work. And we met generally, I think, in uh, Three Rivers. Uh, all the rest spoke French quite fluently. And I don't speak French, unfortunately. And I don't understand it. And uh, although I had worked in Montreal for two or three years at that point and had done a little initial attempt to do something with French. I decided it was really a little bit too late for me. But it was very interesting to sit in that sort of a situation. Periodically, somebody would be able to translate for me what was going on in the mm -hmm. discussion. But sometimes you could sense what, you know, what was happening, just the way people were interacting. And it was also interesting that quite often, uh, it would end up that the two Montreal branches were thinking the same way rather than the two French-speaking branches. Mm -hmm. uh, that, and uh, that had more to do with the history of the uh, involvement with the association mm -hmm. than with the language. Right. What were some of the issues? But I don't know yeah. when. It, it, it was after I left Montreal that the, uh, uh, it became separate. Mm -hmm. What were some of the issues that were involved in those discussions that you were uh, observing? Was there a fight about, or a fight, a disagreement about whether or not there should be a, um, a Quebec corporation? I don't, I don't think so. I can't. Re I, uh, as a matter of fact, as I say, I don't remember that there were uh, any difficulties 
in uh, getting this thing set up. Uh, and it's too long ago to remember, uh, you know, what uh, any mediator, mediating kind of uh, decisions were made. Um, that was really uh, before there was a push uh, nationally to move to provincial organizations. Mm -hmm. you know, that was quite a while before the Alberta Association formed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you were at McGill for a few years and then uh, again returned to Alberta, didn't you? Mm -hmm. What induced you to come back that time? Well, uh, when I came back, I really was thinking primarily that Alberta was a possible place to come to wait to uh, try for a United Nations appointment. I really was interested in going abroad at that point, uh, partly because we'd had some Ethiopian students at McGill. Partly, I think, because I felt that, you know, it would be something where you would feel something important was going on in connection with the uh, developing world. Mm -hmm. uh, I, had, I had one of the Ethiopian students in the, the field placement uh, group that I had in uh, Montreal, and I had found it kind of interesting working with him, uh, the kinds of things he felt were going to be useful in terms of his country, and then he would uh, fill me in on the things that uh, he felt were important to know about Ethiopia and so on. Yeah. And I guess what started me on the idea of the UN was that there was a UN uh, position advertised uh, that had to do uh, with social work from the UN. And I thought, ha, oh, you know, that would be quite an interesting thing. Well, actually, it had long since been filled before I ever saw the thing. But then I thought, oh, well, I'll just, uh, you know, let the application stand, and they give you some kind of a form letter that says you'll go on a waiting list and so on. Well, then, actually, by the time I went down there and uh, started to check it out in terms of their waiting they don't have any such thing at all. It just really depends on who happens to surface at any given time, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> who, uh, you know, who knows what's going to be coming up and so on. So I, I fairly quickly uh, lost interest in the idea of going with the UN. But in the meantime, I had anchored to the job in Edmonton on the uh, expectation uh, that uh, it would be a good place for me to come and sort of wait. Mm -hmm. And when I applied for the job, uh, the director was uh, quite uh, quite agreeable on the basis that, you know, if it came up, they would give them the absence kind of thing. And where was it that you applied? The family service. Mm -hmm. And that was actually, interestingly enough, through this uh, friend who had been on the English uh, experience on the English uh, uh, plan with me. She oh. had come from Winnipeg and her husband was in the bank and they had been transferred to Edmonton uh, quite some time before and I had retained contact with uh, the, some of the people I'd been close with on that English experience and uh, Glenn uh, knew that Glenn was doing a uh, temporary job or a part-time one or something at the family service at that time. And I think I mentioned to her in some of the correspondence that I was planning to come back to Edmonton. Oh. I thought I would, mm -hmm. you know, sort of wait it out here. And so she knew that the agency was going to be looking for a case consultant and she thought I would be a good person. And so she told the director and she told me. and. <laughs> okay. Well, there you were. That's right. Yes. Yes. Um, during the time that you were working with the Family Service Agency here in Edmonton, a couple of other developments were occurring. Again, I'm not sure about the time on this, but you'll tell me if I'm out of sequence here. 
the uh, development of the Alberta Association of Social Workers and the mm -hmm. development of the School of Social Work in Calgary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was that hap were those things happening during that? Yes. Yes. And how were you involved you, in those? You knew uh, or have had contact with Amelda Chenard. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Amelda was the one that really got the uh, initial push in connection with the school off the ground. Yeah. Because the university here had always uh, been quite cool to the idea of a school of social work. Uh, at that time, the University of Calgary and the University of Alberta were one university. It was during Dr. John's time as president, and Dr. John's uh, circulated all of faculty people to ask what they saw as important within the next five year development or something like that. Amelda, in her position at the University Hospital, was actually technically on the staff of the university. And uh, so she wrote the letter to Dr. Johns in connection with this and uh, sparked a real interest in the need for a school of social work. Mm -hmm. Resulting from that, it was possible uh, for the two uh, uh, branches of the association, the Edmonton and Calgary branch, uh, to work together to see about uh, getting something going. And then the Calgary Junior League got into the act and financed uh, the sort of preliminary commission that was set up from the two universities and the two branches. And Imelda and I both served on that commission and felt as if we were commuting between Edmonton and Calgary, I tell you, at some point. We seemed to be driving back and forth so frequently while other people flew. <laughs> anyway, that was quite an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. And then it was during that time that the uh, uh, provincial association uh, started to form. And uh, again, I was uh, fairly involved in that uh, through, the, uh, through the Edmonton uh, Association. And I became the first president of the Alberta Association mm -hmm. and uh, served for a couple of years. Uh, executive and again then this time we were commuting between Red Deer and Edmonton. We held up our meetings, regular meetings in Red Deer. Mm -hmm. You had probably seen some changes and when you first described uh, described your first job in Edmonton and Calgary, you were the sounds like about the only social worker. Especially the first one in, in Calgary, <coughs> certainly, not in mm -hmm. Edmonton, because mm -hmm. by the time I came back to work in Edmonton, even before the war. There was Lillian Thompson here and Margaret Dick. When the Provincial Association was formed in the mid 50s, then in the late 50s, I guess it was. was it? You know, it must have been the late 50s, I would think. Although my, you know, my memory for dates is really pretty poor. Um, what kind of numbers were you dealing with at that time, as far as membership goes? I have any idea about probably around 100. We don't know. Mm -hmm. um, were there other ways in which things had changed for the profession during those years here in Alberta? Oh, sure, certainly, a uh, great many ways. Uh, from the very beginning, once social workers began to be here in any number, they were by far the majority were in government positions rather than in voluntary or agency positions. Mm -hmm. So that there's always been a kind of imbalance here, uh, really, uh, in quite a reverse way to what there has been in most places in the East, particularly Ontario. Yeah. And I would say to a lesser degree, Quebec. But even in Quebec, I would say that the French agencies in Montreal as well as and Quebec City as well as the English agencies in Montreal that it was the voluntary agencies that had the uh, 
professional social workers before the government moved into the area. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the big differences between social work here and social work in the province. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it, it has played, it certainly played a role in uh, our professional organization always having pretty, pretty mixed feelings, I guess, maybe, about any kind of uh, an advocacy role. Why, is, <clears throat> why, is, why would that be the case? Well, there are too many of, too many, uh, of the uh, group involved uh, who are uh, being paid by the government. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that uh, it, it has affected that, I think, from the very beginning. Are there any instances in which that has been a particular difficulty as far as social progress generally goes? I don't know whether it has or not. It's hard to say, really. Uh, I think maybe the professional organizations have always uh, had two schools of thought about the extent to which they should be providing any kind of an advocacy role. Uh, I think in some instances, councils of social agencies in the earlier days were able to play that role. Uh, I think that as things got more complex and as things became more uh, diversified, if you will, that became less and less possible mm -hmm. for the uh, councils. And uh, the councils then became uh, much more of a kind of activist group that tried to activate uh, groups to be, uh, become more. Yeah. And where, where does that leave, um, what role does that leave then, or what roles does that leave to the professional association? Well, I don't think the professional association has really uh, decided on that. I don't know. And I, again, I think it's becoming increasingly difficult for the professional association to decide on it. Because now there are so many uh, different people moving in to the uh, areas that social work previously has been in, in connection with the voluntary uh, agencies, in connection with government. Uh, the lines between what social workers and psychologists are doing, the lines between the, what different social workers are doing with different kinds of backgrounds is quite uh, quite mixed now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of lack of clarity. Mm -hmm. There's so many now sort of additional uh, training programs that people are picking up after their social work in connection with additional skills, and they vary so considerably. Uh, you know, all the way from the way out really kooky things <laughs> coming up from some of the areas in the, uh, you know, the California area, and to the very sound ones. And yeah. it, you know, it's uh, really hard to know now. Just, <laughs> it's a hard time, I think, for people in the profession to it certainly seems to be a very confusing time for people in the profession here in mm -hmm. Alberta. Uh, things seem to be happening in both the uh, better, uh, both the provincial and, and city government in connection with uh, social work positions that are very hard to follow. If you're outside, the, you know, it, it may be easy to follow for the people who are inside the uh, setup. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But looking at it from outside, you sort of feel, gee, certainly a lot of uh, scuttlebutt going on, and you wonder what. What's happening? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> I, I sort of strayed away there from, from a chronology, and I'm conscious that, we're, that my questions are taking a lot of time. You, when you left the Family Service Association, was it that to become the new yes. the university? Mm -hmm. um, how did your social work training help you in that job as dean? Well, I think that you operate on the basis of uh, 
sort of what you know and uh, the kinds of things that you find uh, are, uh, you know, that you're capable of doing. Mm -hmm. So I suppose from that point of view, uh, some of the uh, activity that I was involved in, uh, I might not have been involved in if I had not been uh, out of a social work background, I don't know. Uh, but traditionally, uh, the kinds of problems that will come to a dean of women uh, are problems that might come to a social worker. Uh, you know, uh, there may be uh, all sorts of uh, individual kinds of things uh, that uh, would uh, certainly uh, be something that in a context other than the university, uh, might be seeking a social worker. Uh, from the question of uh, finance to the question of uh, uh, making plans for an expected child when they weren't uh, anticipating this. Mm -hmm. uh, married or unmarried sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that surfaced while I was at the university uh, that did involve a fair bit of uh, social work kind of knowledge and activity was the mature women students who were coming to university, either coming back or coming for the first time, uh, who were single parents, uh, many of whom at that time were receiving social allowance from the province and were trying to get their uh, university degree so that they would be in a better position to become sole support for their children. Uh -huh. And there were enough of these women at the university uh, that became visible through the uh, University Women's Club bursary program for mature students. And this led us into some real concern for this group as a group and for some of the pressures that uh, they were facing uh, with their programs and uh, with their uh, schedule on campus. So that we were able to form uh, a group for the mature women students. And they found this helpful, just simply knowing uh, that there were others in the same boat and having a chance to get together and share some of their concerns and some of their answers. And. Uh, then through that, we also had a fair bit of contact with the provincial government in trying to establish uh, some greater flexibility within the uh, student, or, uh, student loan program. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, that uh, didn't really get sustained through the uh, provincial government. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there other things that you'd like to say about uh, your, your term as Dean of Women? And, uh, well, it was, a very it was a very interesting time to be Dean of Women because it was at the height of the student protest era. And uh, so it was quite interesting to see how that affected some of what the students were doing and some of their way of thinking and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, which may have been to some extent just an exaggeration of what students tend to traditionally display at university, but I don't think so. I think it was really more than that. And it was really quite <laughs> quite interesting. I remember when they were wanting to start the daycare. Uh, it was a good hot issue, you know, and it was an issue before it was uh, really something that had uh, sort of grassroots uh, kind of motion. But eventually it uh, did get handled. Uh, in a, you know, eventually it took long enough building up that it, it was possible to uh, get it reasonably well planned. But at one point when the uh, Women's Society had handed it over to the Students' Union, the girl who was taking responsibility in the students union for it and whoever she was working with decided that they should get the place going, you know, get a daycare going right away and the place to get it going was uh, there were some spare spots in Lister Hall which was the student residence and so they 
they were all set to go ahead. Mm -hmm. No thought that they would have to negotiate with the students in Lister Hall. <laughs> of course, the students said, we don't want it. And then they, other students were mad. <laughs> yeah. know, it's just so, so typical. <laughs> so again, it just left, got left for another year. And that was why, because by the time it really surfaced again, there was somebody on hand to really take it Stick in the direction it through, should yeah. go, and, yeah. and uh, with enough maturity that they could involve uh, knowledgeable people in the community and so on, and, and it went ahead. Mm -hmm. That was fine. But it was an interesting time to be there to see the kind of thing that could happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, we had one very interesting Women's Week program and uh, had brought in, uh, I wish I could remember her name psychiatrist from uh, California area and she was very good very she arrived in the midst of a terrible blizzard I think and was just so delightful and so she was awfully good mm -hmm. and it was a good program that the students ran um, I'd like to move now to a couple of concluding questions if I might mm -hmm. um, one is uh, as you look back over your career as a social worker and the various things that you've done, if there are accomplishments of which you're particularly proud, what would you please do? Well, I suppose just sort of starting with the most recent, and perhaps because I'm still involved, I would say uh, in connection with the university, uh, some of the work with the mature women students, but uh, to an even greater extent, uh, the kind of indirect role that I was able to play in connection with the daycare, because it did get established uh, well, and it has functioned uh, extremely uh, well since then. And uh, I think that, I guess I have a, a very firm conviction myself out of my interest in children's work that a bad daycare is worse than no daycare almost. You know? And that if a university is going to have any responsibility whatsoever in connection with the daycare, then it better be a good one. Right. Right. Are there other things that, that you're pleased about that you've done? Yes, I think I was uh, pleased with the uh, time at the family agency here. It was a time when we were building the agency. It was a time when uh, professional staff in the agency had not been uh, very strongly anchored, where there had sometimes been people with uh, professional training and sometimes not. And, and uh, the agency had been fairly static for quite a long time, I think, after the war. And uh, it was a time of sort of building the agency, trying to recruit young people uh, to come in and then get their uh, professional training and so on, trying to uh, hang to what we felt casework could do in the community and uh, the importance of uh, young social workers having a chance to uh, work gradually in the whole area of casework and, and you know, in a fairly broad mixed setting so that they weren't just handling one type of case. Mm -hmm. And that was a that was a, a good experience. We had good boards and it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. And as a concluding question, I'd like to ask you what what is meant to you to call yourself a professional social worker? How do you mean what it's meant to me? <clears throat> it, it has it has it uh, as you define yourself, as you think of who you are as a person, mm -hmm. what you are, and the kind of work you've done, has, um, how has being or ha having social work training uh, been meaningful to you through the years? Well, I suppose it's uh, been uh, it's been meaningful in that it continues to uh, spur you on to understanding more and more as best you can, 
uh, what kinds of uh, pressures, what kinds of uh, opportunities are important for people. And I suppose it does uh, certainly uh, give you some basic commitment, both in connection with your uh, sort of current life situation, but also in connection with, uh, you know, what's going on for the future. What's going on for the future as far as your own future? No, 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 as far as the future of the world and people is concerned, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, more in the uh, area of, uh, you know, sort of uh, political and, and uh, environmental realities and anything. Yeah. Something to anchor to, perhaps. I wonder if there's anything that you'd like to add, things that we haven't talked about that I have. No, I guess at this point, I just feel a little sad that social work seems to have gone off in so many different directions. And I guess my one concern, and I may be wrong on this, but I get a feeling now that there's a strong tendency of people in the area of social work to feel that the important thing is to do whatever it is they want to do, that there's less, how to put this without sounding preachy, I, you know, accepting the fact that everybody can't work with everybody and that some people are going to, you know, just clash. I still think that for social work as a whole, the social worker should be able to be geared to the fact that everybody coming uh, in, uh, that you, you make some kind of a contact with them and some kind of uh, uh, outreach mm -hmm. uh, to support that person in their uh, concern and find a way of uh, resolving the difficulty. So. <clears throat> Let me see if I can carry if I carry that through if I if I'm hearing what you're saying then that it, there's been a lot of emphasis on specialization and, and, mm -hmm. and if one is I don't know really what specialties are well, well I don't know myself <laughs> <laughs> well for myself example my specialty is social policy and social uh -huh. planning uh -huh. and yet if I hear what you're saying I shouldn't allow that to prevent me from trying to interact in my meetings my social policy meetings in a humane, helpful way. Well, that's certainly, I would, I would agree with that. <laughs> I, don't know. I wasn't thinking so much of the different, uh, the different specialties in terms of uh, teaching, mm -hmm. uh, uh, social policy administration, and so on. But I think that is a part of it, mm -hmm. really. I still remember one of Joy Maine's comments about the number of young men who were going into doctoral uh, studies in connection with social work <laughs> at a fairly early stage. And she referred to the fact that she thought in many instances it was a flight uh, from uh, the basic concerns of social work. And I still have a feeling that that happened in the schools. Uh -huh. uh, I think the number of things have played into that, and I think it's not just alone in the social work profession, but uh, again, the uh, university moves to have full-time people, uh, not very many active practitioners, so yeah. Okay, well, in conclusion, I would like to thank you very much for your time this afternoon, and for the information and thoughts and feelings that you've shared. It's been really informative for me. Much appreciated. Well, it's been interesting for me, Karen, and I thank you for uh, getting in touch with me and asking me to be a part of your project. <laughs> Thanks very much. Have you had any? Uh, this is a piece of candy weaving that was given to me as I was leaving Africa by a group that was a mixed uh, group of uh, YMYW. Uh, various young people's groups. 
uh, that were interested in programs for teenagers. I was with the National YWCA of Ghana as a consultant from the World YWCA, and I was working in Kumasi, which is the second city of Ghana, and they were wanting to start a vocational school for girls and had obtained some property that was just partially built. So when I got there, I found that my major task was to work with the building committee you know, been formed to get the property uh, in a habitable space. <laughs> So I really spent a lot more time in something I had no expertise in at all <laughs> than I did in getting the vocational school itself started. Uh, but the vocational school was started uh, before I left, and uh, there was some kind of a program going on. And that, that was, as I say, a very unexpected gift from this uh, much wider group that I hadn't really uh, been conscious of really uh, doing much with, other than the fact that I did appear at meetings. <laughs> I guess that was important. Okay. Um, this is a, a picture of an Ethiopian angel, uh, and uh, I'm very fond of it because it is sort of typical of the angels that were in the Ethiopian churches, and I was very fortunate to have attended the International Social Welfare Conference in Nairobi, and to have had a tour of Ethiopia before we went to Nairobi, uh, prior to the year prior to when I went to work in Africa. I went to work in Africa in uh, 1975, and was there for uh, about 18 months. This is a little uh, Ghanaian baby who was named after me uh, because she was uh, born uh, to the uh, young man who was my steward and his wife, and I had uh, been somewhat helpful to them uh, in connection with some of the problems that Lucy was facing with her uh, pregnancy and the hospitalization requirement and so on. Uh, that's a picture of the family itself, and uh, that was where I was living. Okay. Okay. okay.